Okay, I'm going to introduce the network action teams. So each year, as part of our annual summit, EAN seeks pitches for promising opportunities to help Vermont rapidly, cost-effectively, and equitably reduce fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas pollution. Our summit attendees, all of you, vote on which pitches they believe best fit our criteria, which you will actually find uh, on page three of your agenda if you want to see them. And then after the day of the summit, we also have a second round of voting after the summit where all of our network members and public sector partners have a chance to vote on which pitches they think are most promising. In order to ensure that selected pitches lead to concrete action, we, we provide support to form network action teams, which are made up of network members and public sector partners who work together to co-create the best strategies for moving the pitch idea forward. Later this afternoon, you're going to get to hear four new pitches, and you're going to get a chance to vote on them. But right now, we want to provi provide a time for you to hear from some of our co-chairs of our network action teams about their initial goals, the progress they've made, and their next steps. So these are the teams that have been going on for the last year or two. And you can see them all listed on the slide there. I'm only giving each of these wonderful people five minutes to tell you about their network action team and the work they've been doing. And we'll continue to, using, to continue using Slido for Q&A. So if you have questions for any of these groups, please put them in there and we'll try to make sure we have enough time to answer some of those questions. We're going to do this in two groups. So I've invited up some folks who can talk to you about weatherization at scale, clean heat standard, and switch and save. Actually, I'm just, I just need those three here right now. And then we're going to do a second group for future rural transit climate workforce <laughs> and the others. Sorry about that. <laughs> I only just noticed chairs arrived. Um, I do want to mention really quickly that there was a really exciting uh, um, thing that came out of the Replace Your Ride pitch from two years ago. The Replace Your Ride program went live last week, and that is a program. Yay! For those of you that don't know, that was pitched a couple of years ago, and that program provides incentives to help lower income Vermonters scrap their older high polluting vehicles for a range of clean transportation or shared mobility options. So we're really excited that that is now active, thanks to the Agency of Transportation. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to our co-chairs now. We're going to start with Neil Lunderville and weatherization at scale. Hello, everyone, and great to be with you here today. And it's so good to start our conversation about network action teams in the place we, we always start our conversation about energy, is that how do we use less? How do we use less energy across all the sectors? And so for the last couple of years, the Weatherization at Scale Network Action Team has been tackling this problem in the thermal sector with the fundamental question is how do we get more money into weatherization? Importantly, not just a little bit of money and a little bit of money one time, but how do we get long-term, stable, and growing funding to meet the state requirements around climate? And how do we expand our weatherization network and give that network the support they need to continue to do this great work? And why weatherization? Well, my friend Sue Minter said it great. We don't want to heat the outdoors. We also want to make sure that Vermonters are spending less on their bills every month, that they, that they have affordable housing by having lower energy costs, that they have a more comfortable home, a healthier home, and additionally, one that is better for the planet with a lower carbon footprint. So we know that we need that long-term stable funding to do it. Of course, there are workforce challenges. We've been working on that, um, that, that come with it. We also understand that the workforce challenges will be helped when the, the funding for this is stable, where the private market can look out and say, there's going to be a slug of money for weatherization for the next five, 10, 20 years, and they can build teams to do the work inside of folks' homes. So we think that is very important. So this team came together two years ago, and over the last two years, uh, we've had a, a good number of successes. About two years ago, we stood here, Ludi Bill and I, we talked about the need to weatherize 120,000 Vermont homes, especially low and moderate income homes, by the end of this decade. And we said we, one way we do that 
is to make sure we have a really strong working on bill financing uh, in Vermont, and that is one way of the many ways we need to get financing in place. A few months later, we were proud to work with the administration and ultimately the legislature to introduce an on-bill on financing package that went right to the meter. It ended up becoming called RAP, the Weatherization uh, Repayment Assistance Pilot or Program, led by Maura Collins at VHFA. They have done outstanding work on this. The legislature passed it, and just a couple, two weeks ago, the PUC approved this tariff. This on-bill financing to the meter will go into effect very soon. And it, it is as a result of the work that this weatherization at scale coalition did. We didn't stop there. We also know that it's not it's going to be it's not going to be any one thing that uh, that brings the weatherization money that we need. It's going to be a lot of small piles of money and a lot of small ways to fund it that we pulled together and really focus it on low and moderate income. So we've uh, we've advanced to the legislature and the administration several funding proposals. Uh, the one that we sent last year, we said. Look at, let's look at the state global warming solutions act requirements. How do we how do we work to practically meet the goals? Uh, we proposed seventy two million dollars in funding over over the next four years for weatherization. The governor and the legislature delivered with eighty million dollars in funding over the next four years. So we take that now going forward. What do we do? We have to take that and we have to add to it what's coming along the lines in the Inflation Reduction Act. There's going to be more millions that are going to be able to be leveraged for, especially for low and moderate income Vermonters to make, uh, to make these weatherization uh, goals a reality. Um, that is not ultimately gonna be enough. We still have to work as a coalition to uh, continue to grow long-term funding over, over time. So it's gonna take a lot of these small efforts that come together um, to, uh, uh, to, to really fund this long-term. There's also another opportunity here. We know that with the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a lot of money for uh, fuel optimization or fuel switching inside the home. How do we take weatherization and pair it with fuel switching or fuel optimization so that we do it at once and we really make that home uh, <clears throat> sustainable for the long term? If we can focus these efforts on low and moderate income affordability, we are really doing some great work. That's the work of our coalition over the next year or two. I also want to mention a couple other things. We've had great partners uh, with the Clean Heat Standard team. Uh, weatherization and Clean Heat Standard go together like salt and pepper or peanut butter and chocolate. I mean, it's just, a, they have to go together. It doesn't work, but they don't go together. And we've been working really closely with them and look forward to advancing that in the year ahead. Weatherization Workforce is an effort that has, uh, that climate workforce in general that we're really attuned to. And that coupled with how we technically approach a whole home approach. One thought I'll leave you with. Uh, over the last year, Senator Leahy, uh, in, in doing part to the work of the coalition, uh, put in a congressionally directed spending request for $8.5 million for a, a clean homes effort, a whole home effort, where we're doing this weatherization plus fuel optimization plus panel upgrades so that the homes of the future in Vermont are really able to take advantage of all of, of the great things coming down the line. This is the work of the Weatherization at Scale Coalition. We are continuing in the year ahead. We are always looking for new partners. We have a great long list of partners. I won't go through them all here, but our strength comes in the diversity of partners that we're able to bring to the table. We meet regularly, weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, um, to talk about the issues that are in front of us and to, to work in a collective way uh, to, to move this forward. So we welcome your feedback, but really your participation uh, will help us continue to move forward in the year ahead. Thanks. Um, now we'd like to welcome Chris Nimi and Rich Cowart to tell you about the Clean Heat Standard. Thanks, Cara. So I'm going to uh, start this off and then uh, tell you where we've been, um, and then Rich is going to uh, seg uh, segue to explain where we think we're going. So this is a, a graph that um, replicates uh, in a simpler form something that Jared showed earlier, which is the magnitude of the emission reduction that we actually have to achieve in the state to meet uh, both our Global Warming Solutions Act requirements and uh, arguably our moral imperatives uh, to, uh, uh, to make the world a livable place. Uh, the clean heat standard was designed to uh, address the building's component of this uh, pretty substantial and, and challenging emission reduction requirement. 
Uh, we, uh, as a group, um, or the, or the, the Cleethe Center Working Group formed uh, nearly two years ago. Uh, there were uh, maybe a dozen uh, folks who participated um, uh, very regularly for the first seven, eight months, probably on a weekly basis, and, uh, and fairly regularly since then, although not quite as, as frequently. And then a number of others who uh, provided um, uh, feedback along the way. Uh, during that process, we uh, worked through a, a number of design uh, program policy design details, uh, thought of the, the, the pros and cons of various options, and came together as a group as a consensus around a, an approach that we ended up uh, uh, codifying, if you will, in a fairly extensive white paper um, that was published by EAN. That paper was then turned into legislation uh, in both the House and the Senate. Uh, there was testimony that Rich and I did and a number of other members of, of, our, of our coalition, of our working group, uh, before committees in both houses. Uh, the, the, the approach was, was modified and improved in a number of important ways as a result of feedback from a variety of different parties. Ultimately passed uh, both houses, um, uh, was then vetoed by the governor and, and came within one vote of uh, overriding the veto. Uh, so it came very close to being, being enacted as kind of an overarching framework for addressing the, the thermal sector. So progress, but more work to do. Rich. Okay, on the work to do, I'm going to echo the thanks that you've heard um, from Neil and Chris already to EAN and to many partners out there who have really worked hard on this over the past couple of years. First thing we're going to do is continue uh, with the working group. I'd like to um, invite uh, anybody to approach us. Um, if you'd like to work on this you know, challenging and wonderful uh, policy initiative. Um, we're going to renew the working group. We're going to continue to develop the idea. We're going to include amendments to the idea as needed to better and more clearly address uh, life cycle analysis, issues like equity and uh, in implementation. Uh, and as Neil said, to make it really clear that we, to the maximum degree possible, we want to uh, combine weatherization and clean heat to think about whole buildings, the homes that people live in, the buildings we work in as complete buildings. Um, and we intend to be ready to support a renewed effort in the legislature to pass uh, a clean heat standard or an affordable homes standard or a clean homes standard, whatever you want to call it, but to get this done both with respect to e efficiency of building shells and fuel sources uh, that we use to heat buildings in this state. And I hope that um, there are people in this room and people in the legislature who really uh, want to put their shoulders to the wheel again um, and get this done. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to ask Darren Springer and Linda McGinnis to talk about Switch and Save. Okay. Thank you. I'm Darren Springer, General Manager with Burlington Electric Department, joined by Linda McGinnis, world famous economist and environmental advocate and senior fellow at EAM. <laughs> and, and we're here to um, talk about Switch and Save. Um, and we didn't make the pitch on Switch and Save. Uh, if you were at the summit at the Sugarbush uh, Resort, you might remember that pitch. Uh, we worked with the team um, and helped to co-chair the effort. And we had a great group of partners that we've got at the end here. But uh, just starting at the beginning, what is the point of the Switch and Save group is to promote changing out fossil fuel equipment and helping the state meet its thermal and transportation sector emissions goals. Because as Jared pointed out earlier on, Thermal and transportation are roughly three quarters of the challenge in the state of Vermont. And we've done a great job decarbonizing the electric grid. And now we need to utilize some of that decarbonized electric grid to get some of our devices off of fossil fuel and onto renewable energy. So we had a great discussion about where to focus our initial efforts in year one. And we landed on heat pump water heaters. And this uh, graph right here shows the Climate Council pathway reduction 
uh, for heat pump water heaters. And I can tell you, at Burlington Electric, we offer incentives for anything you can electrify. We're trying to become a net zero city by 2030. And heat pump water heater incentives were not something that was jumping off the page when I looked at the monthly uptake. Um, this is a technology that a lot of people aren't thinking about, and yet it is water heating, 20%, 25% in some cases, usually the, the second largest uh, fossil fuel use in a home behind heating. And so we said, what can we do to boost the adoption on heat pump water heaters? And uh, in the 2022 session, the goal was to establish a pilot program uh, that we could utilize to help, in particular, income qualified Vermonters uh, switch out from a fossil fuel water heater to a more efficient uh, heat pump water heater and save money and save carbon. Now, I can't take credit for this cartoon. I'm pretty sure Linda uh, put this one in here. Uh, if you can't read it, it says, well, at least we know the basement doesn't leak um, as you see water filling up uh, from the water heater here. And I think one of the things that we really focused on is helping people switch uh, before it breaks. Uh, how do we have a program that can really work to get people to change out that old water heater before it breaks as opposed to waiting until it breaks and then you have to figure out, oh, do I need to get an electrician? Do I need to do something to change out my electric panel uh, breaker to be able to put in a heat pump water heater? Um, want to big thank you, uh, give a big thank you to all the legislators who are here. And in particular, we have several folks from the Energy and Technology Committee uh, Representative Briglin, Representative Sibelia, Representative Yantachka, we may have others. Uh, that committee really got this thing moving uh, in the legislature and supported an appropriation of $5 million as part of the climate funding package in the legislature to the House Appropriations Committee. And from there, it moved through uh, the entire process and was enacted into law. So we had a success. And uh, we want to thank everybody who worked on that with us. Um, and I want to talk about the program a little bit and then also next steps. The pilot program, as I understand it, we have folks from the uh, Department of Public Service and the administration here, uh, is hopefully going to launch um, you know, towards the beginning of next year. Uh, it's paired with $20 million in funding for electric panel upgrades, which is an important pairing between these two efforts. And the program is going to focus on these water heater changeouts for income qualified uh, Vermonters and this is our great list of partners. Uh, you can see we had a variety of folks working on this, uh, utilities, environmental advocates, uh, we had cap agencies, we had uh, different folks in the energy and environmental space, environmental organizations and others. Uh, so we wanna give a big thank you to all the partners who are mentioned here. And then just lastly, trying to keep us on time, uh, where do we go from here uh, with the success? Was that a zero minutes? One minute, okay, great. Uh, where do we go here with a success? What's the next approach that this group wants to take to continue uh, to change out fossil fuel equipment? We've got two ideas, uh, and we're gonna try to settle on one of them. Um, one is uh, an idea that would be focused on um, you know, trying to amp up the program incentives for things around lawn equipment and off-road vehicles and a sector that maybe doesn't get as much focus. Uh, but in a lot of cases, uh, lawn equipment can be a big uh, source of local air pollution and uses a good bit of fossil fuel. And we have some good incentives out there, but we could do more. The second one, which I'm, I'm particularly excited about and, and I've been excited about for a long time and I think it's time has come, is whether we could do something around creating a phase out date for the purchase of uh, diesel buses in the state of Vermont. Um, and that's something that we might be looking at as well for this group is an effort to try to say, just like we're doing with cars, we're having a conversation around cars. Um, we know uh, in Burlington, we helped incentivize two electric transit buses uh, for the Green Mountain Transit fleet. And it's a wonderful thing. Uh, you talk about a win, win, win. Use local renewable energy to fuel these buses. You're gonna save money on operating costs. You're gonna reduce air pollution in the community and really have a good, equitable, electrified uh, transportation option. So we're looking at both of those things. We invite folks, just like Rich said, to talk with us if you have ideas or thoughts on where this group can focus and if you have something that you'd like to contribute or be a part of the group. And I'll stop there. Thank everybody, appreciate it. I knew these guys were amazing, but I didn't actually know that they'd be able to give their presentations in five minutes to a, to a person. That was amazing. Okay, 
So, now we have some time for Q&A, so remember to be adding your questions in and uploading what you'd like to hear answered. There's some microphones at the table, they may need to be flipped on. It looks like our first question is about mobile home weatherization. Do you, ha do you have any thoughts about how we address mobile home weatherization? Neil, I think that's probably heading towards you. That, that, can, okay. Uh, that, is, that, that is certainly a, a tough issue. Mobile homes are notoriously hard to weatherize. Um, you know, we think about how we can do other things inside of creating affordable housing to make sure that the affordable housing we are building is both affordable and sustainable for the long term. Uh, I think one thing we've been thinking about, is, it's not particular to mobile homes, but it is about renters. Uh, renters are a particularly challenging group to help with weatherization because of what they call the split incentive. They often pay the energy bills, but don't own the building, of course, that's why they're renters. And so how do we help uh, or, or help or push forward uh, building owners to make the updated improvements to their buildings so that they are, uh, that, that the folks are actually spending less. And a considerable amount of work has gone on there, but I think a lot more needs to, to occur. That's something our coalition's talked about. I believe it's one of the pitches that's coming a bit later. So hopefully we can, we can weave a, a discussion about mobile homes into some of these, knowing that it is a, it's a challenging topic. Thanks, Neil. I'm gonna skip the question about workforce supply because we're gonna talk about that in a minute with the second round of network action teams. So I will ask, um, let's see, there's a question about the clean heat standard uh, things keep moving around. One question about the last clean heat standard was how it interacts with utility tier three requirements. Will this be addressed in a future iteration? Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, when we worked uh, with our working group on the, the design of, of the clean heat standard, there, there were a number of different choices that could have been made. Um, and we thought about this question at, uh, at some length, got input from, from Darren, uh, from Green Mountain Power and others, and uh, ultimately concluded that we thought the best approach was for the clean heat standard to function as the overarching umbrella policy that would set the overall emission reduction goal, and that any of the emission reductions that would occur as a result of individual electric utilities pursuing simultaneously their tier three obligations would simply be issued credits that would count towards the overarching requirements in the clean heat standard. So it would be a subset of the emission reductions. I think we estimated that about by two, the current uh, tier three requirements would produce about a 7% reduction in building emissions uh, to contribute to the overall 40% reduction that was needed. Um, so an important component, but not anywhere close to how much was ultimately needed. Um, but that there's, there's really no issue with having both of those policies in parallel, um, that you can do a project that would qualify for clean heat uh, requirements and so simultaneously qualify uh, for the clean heat standard credit requirements. Uh, and by setting it up that way, we would ensure there wouldn't be competition uh, between different entities going after the same customer or the same credits, um, that they would count towards both uh, and therefore uh, kind of induce kind of collaboration within the market uh, for achieving our ends. Anything you want to add to that? Bye. Okay, there's a question about the RAP program. I know more Collins is in the room. I don't know if this might go to you. Um, how do we duplicate RAP in the fuel, oil, and propane markets? Well, I will answer and Maura can jump in, but I'm so glad this was asked because RAP is intended as a statewide policy, meaning that it's, it's all, everywhere. Uh, right now we have a number of utilities, we, the, just going back a little bit, once this, the, the legislature supported this effort, uh, VHFA took a leading role on to help coordinate utilities submitting a tariff to the Public Utility Commission, a general tariff that would apply to every utility that's submitted. Uh, as of today, near, most utilities have, not every utility has, but nearly all utilities have, including uh, Green Mountain Power and other, and other utilities that cover a broad section of the state where there is oil and propane. So this does apply in those areas. And I think it's important, and over time, we do expect that all utilities will participate in this, but when we can put this on-bill financing uh, for weatherization and also for fuel optimization, for fuel switching on the bill, and to the meter, 
that was a way we could help low and moderate income customers who may not have the credit or upfront capital to be able to uh, do some of the important home improvements that they need. So importantly, to answer this question, RAP does apply to, to fuel oil and propane territories. Uh, eventually it will apply to every utility, we hope, around the state covering all Vermonters uh, to make this option available to all of them. Okay, there's a comment here that there's been good progress on electrification of tr public transit buses, and we need more work on school buses. And I'm gonna expand that question a little bit and say, how can folks get involved in helping decide, decide what the next Switch and Save program might be? Okay, so, yeah, so switch on? it on. There's a little, there you go. Sorry. Um, we absolutely feel like school buses should be incorporated in this. So when we talk about buses, we mean all buses, transit and school buses, um, and looking at a date certain by which there would be no new purchase of any diesel bus in Vermont. So that's the idea that we're looking at. And we felt that it would be uh, really complementary to the funds that will be coming in to help switch to electric buses. And there should be considerable funds kind of coming in under the IRA for that. Um, in terms of, what was the second question? How people might get involved. Oh, in of course. Yeah. How you can get involved. Well, um, we have a network action team, and in, if you want to come up to either Darren or myself sometime today, or if you have others who you know might be interested, send them uh, our, send their names to us or tell us, um, and we will be scheduling in the next three weeks or so our next meeting that will vote on which direction we're going to take either moving into uh, lawn equipment and or off-road vehicle type of things, um, because that is an area that no one's really looking at terribly deeply, or looking at the policy uh, environment on um, uh, no new diesel buses. Okay, there's a question here that I think could actually go to any of you. Um, it's a question about supply chain issues. Um, and the question is, is there a workforce problem with heat pump water heaters, and is there a supply pro problem? But I think that that gets to all of the programs that we're working on. How are supply chains and workforce impacting these programs? Yeah, this is a common theme, I think, throughout all of the work that we're doing on climate, uh, is yes, uh, there is a workforce challenge. Yes, there is a supply chain challenge. Um, in designing the switch and save pilot, we were conscious of that and tried to create a time frame for uh, the utilization of the funds that really tried to account for the idea that this may need some, some ramp up. Uh, we had uh, Vermont Energy Contracting and Supply, which is one of the uh, leading heat pump installers in the state of Vermont, and they were here. I know I saw Mark earlier. Um, they were part of this group and gave some feedback in terms of what's an achievable goal, uh, given the supply chain and workforce challenges that we have. Um, and I would say, you know, if we look at things even like our electrification efforts for electric vehicles, uh, there are not enough electric vehicles available and the price is too high. Uh, there's not enough folks who are able to sell those who are working on those. Uh, this is a common theme throughout, uh, at least with Switch and Save, we tried to set a reasonable uh, but ambitious goal in terms of the deployment of the funds and how many homes we thought we could reach, uh, given those precise challenges, knowing that they're not going to be fully resolved uh, maybe in the next year or two. So uh, maybe two things to add to that. With respect to the clean heat standard, we were very conscious of the fact that there were going to be supply chain and workforce problems uh, if we only permitted one type of resource to answer the call for cleaner heat. And so the clean heat standard is intentionally written to permit uh, weatherization and five different kinds of fuel optim what Neil calls fuel optimization or uh, cleaner heat choices to participate in the clean heat, um, in meeting the clean heat standard, which opens the door to a lot of different kinds of suppliers and a lot of different kinds of equipment and allows resources that we know well in Vermont, like uh, advanced wood heat, and biofuels to participate in the meeting the carbon reduction goals. That's a practical observation about um, how we can move more quickly with fewer bottlenecks by having more diverse 
resources available to us and recognize that every one of those decisions is complicated and requires careful thought, but uh, it was built into the clean heat standard on purpose, in part for this reason. Okay, another switch and save question. Are municipal or community buildings, libraries, community gathering spaces, et cetera, eligible for switch and save? Switch and save, as it's currently uh, defined, is only for residential, um, but there is another bill that was Laura Sebelius bill, I believe, that is for municipalities which would cover this. So just a little shout out for that bill as well. Um, and just to make sure that we really underscore the equity focus of this, this is really only and will cover almost all the costs, 100% of the costs is what the idea was for low and middle income uh, Vermonters. Um, and that is the equity focus. So I'm going to welcome you to chat with these folks as you see them about these projects. They're really exciting and the conversations are ongoing. Thank you all for coming up here. I'm going to invite our next slide. Do you want to? Have, yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to Cara. Who is I know I speak for the weatherization of scale team, but I think I th speak for all the teams that we would not work without Cara's work. It is behind the scenes and it's often unheralded, but thank you, Cara. Great work. I have the best job in the world because I get to work on all of these teams. It's awesome. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to invite up Gabrielle Stebbins, uh, Jordan Giaconia, Jen Wallace Broder, and Ryan Lambert to talk about the other four network action teams. All right. And we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to give you each about five minutes to talk about your network action team. And we're going to start with Gabrielle Stebbins and Climate Workforce. I have to echo uh, Neil that Cara is amazing, um, but also because of what she does. She takes these amorphous ideas that a bunch of people who spoke to each other for about three hours over three months and come up with, and then she just shapes them and molds them and keeps dealing with this ambiguous concept and ultimately drives things forward. So thank you, Cara. Um, so I am part of the uh, climate, whether it's a climate Workforce Initiative. Uh, my co-chairs are Dylan Giabattista and Cara. Um, and I am on the right side. So our goals, harness the opportunity. Who's going to do all this work that we just heard about? Who's going to be doing the heat pumps? Who's going to be doing the weatherization? Who's going to be doing the switching and saving um, if we don't have the people? Uh, so really, the, the thing that I find most exciting about this is that climate change can be pretty, uh, pretty much of a downer at times, um, but there's something incredibly exciting about the fact that there is this amazing opportunity to have folks who may not be, you know, interested in getting three degrees in things like anthropology and violin, like me, which is very practical. They may not want to get three degrees. Um, but they might want to have, you know, a job where they make a hundred plus K and they actually learn on the job and they go to work and they work with their hands and they're, you know, they, they want a good paying job. They want to give back to their community and they want to help people be more comfortable, uh, save money and save energy. And that is the incredible opportunity here with a climate workforce. So our goal is to figure out the gap. How many people do we have? How many people do we not have? Where are the pieces in the system map that are missing? We know we have tons of great educators in this state. We know we have tons of great workers, tons of great employers, and then we have tons of great nonprofits who, uh, as well as our you know, uh, administration, who put these pieces together um, to connect the dots, to train people, to connect them to employers. So that is the goal, identify the gap, connect the dots, and get a lot of people trained to go out and make money doing good stuff. Um, so, what did we accomplish? Those were the goals. 
what did we accomplish in the last year? We established a lot of committees and working groups because that's the first thing you do always to get something done, tongue in cheek. Um, we have a chair a group, we have a steering committee and a full coalition group. If you're only slightly interested, you can join that. It's only once a quarter and that way you can stay abreast of what we're working on. But then we had three working groups. We had a data analysis group, we had a weatherization workforce group, which is now over housed by Neil, thank you. Um, and then we had an outreach and communications group. Uh, so what do these groups do? Data analysis, a lot of people said, please do not study this to death. We have studied this to death. But we still wanted to know what do we need to get? Uh, what do we have, how many workers, and how do we get to the end goal, which is our uh, climate requirements by 2050? So we, first of all, had to define what a climate workforce is. It's a little bit like a tourism workforce at the federal level and the Department of Labor. We don't have a climate workforce. We have people who are cashiers. We have people who work in um, the hotel industry. Uh, same thing with climate workforce. Climate workforce covers farming, it covers forestry, it covers electricians, plumbing. So it's really broad. It, it covers engineers and water quality scientists. So we had to define it, um, which involved going through uh, a list of 700 plus Vermont occupations. We looked at federal lists, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, we figured it out. Um, it does involve like portions of farming, but not all farming. So like if someone's an apple farmer, are they in climate change? Maybe not. But if they're actually practicing regenerative purposes and they're training that, maybe yes. So we defined that. We looked at the Vermont Clean Energy Industry Report, and then we augmented that to include more than just clean energy, and figured out that we have in 2021 about 18,900 people currently working part or full time in this area, and that, um, this is actually in the report, those two graphs, that for heat pumps, we currently have about 225, and by 2030, we need 450 people uh, installing them. And for electric vehicles, we don't actually need that many of an increase. For weatherization, we have about 770, and by 2030, we need just over 6,000. So we have some work to do. Um, so that's what the data analysis group did. Uh, then we also had the weatherization workforce group, which is still working, and I, because I'm running out of time, I'll leave it. Um, but they are making great strides, so thank you. And then lastly, we had the outreach and communication group. Um, besides this, we mapped out uh, what we have and what we don't have. So these are system maps in terms of um, who are all the partners that we should be connecting with. We're 650,000 people, we're the city of Boston. If we're duplicating efforts with our small budget, we're being very, very inefficient. So who's working in this area? How do we connect um, uh, continuing technical education centers with uh, Vermont Tech, with Vermont Adult Learning, with our higher school, higher education schools, with guidance counselors in high schools, with middle school, with VEEP, with Efficiency Vermont, with all of the uh, trade associations that offer programs and trainings. Um, so basically we developed these system maps of who's doing what, and um, there are also tons of websites out there uh, that you know, suggest how you can uh, have a green career or how you can get a forestry job. How do we connect these dots? And then once we figure out what the gaps are, how do we communicate that as successfully as possible so that people understand it's not just about spray foaming an attic, because that's not all that enticing um, if you're thinking about a long-term career. It's more about how do you uh, advance and develop a pathway forward through a long-term career. Um, and with that, our next steps, uh, so once we figured out what the gap was, the groups um, that met this past June and this past September in the coalition meeting figured out, okay, what we need to do is really hone in and have an employer-centric and an employee-centric working group to figure out what do employers really need from future employees and what do employees need for them to be interested in climate workforce jobs and for them to understand what's available. Um, so we have those two working groups that are starting up in the next two, three weeks. And we will also uh, hopefully be rolling out some mini grants um, so that we can start to connect the dots and actually dig deeper, a little bit deeper into the community rather than 
um, no offense to all of us, but all of us, uh, and, you know, really actually connect into layers where, you know, new American populations, um, uh, folks uh, just coming out of um, incarceration, you know, how do we connect with, with different groups uh, that we historically perhaps haven't been so successful at reaching out to. So, a couple of working groups coming up over the next three months, figuring out what the gaps are, and then uh, going after funding um, and being really creative about how we can actually then launch, I know this is so hard, a marketing initiative, but really to tell people how great this is. Um, and, and, you know, I was interviewing uh, a heat pump installer um, a couple months ago, and I said, how did you find out about this job? And he's like, I don't know, you know, my neighbor or my uncle, something like that. And he started off just one guy, didn't want to go to college. He now has a firm with 30 plus employees. He makes well over 200K a year. He runs his own shop. I mean, this is the type of like, how do we keep Vermont strong, sustainable, and as uh, equal opportunity for as many people as possible while saving money and energy. So win, win, win. I will just say the last thing that we did last year, which is why I brought up my notes, um, we got, thank you federal, uh, federal dollars, we also uh, had a massive economic uh, development bill that came through that launched $3 million uh, for the Vermont Trade Scholarship Program, $15 million to VHCB to establish a construction and rehabilitation learning program and revolving loan fund, $1.8 million to the Department of Forest, Parks and Recs, uh, $500K for the State Refugee Office for grants um, for refugee and new American focused programs, 300K for the Department of Corrections to create a pilot community-based re-entry program. So really connecting the dots of how do we bring all these pieces together? Because it is one of the bright, shining pieces of climate change ahead of us. So if you're interested in joining, we're happy to have you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Jordan. Adjust this accordingly. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm George Giacone, I'm the Public Policy Manager with Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. I'm excited uh, to share out a little bit about clean transportation equity. Um, before I do, just want to give a big shout out to my co-chair, Amanda Carlson with Capstone Community Action. I'll make sure to give Amanda a round of applause, please. So this is actually a unique group. If you all remember our pitch from last year, uh, clean transportation equity is somewhat of a departure from what our original proposal was, which was really more so centered around creating a blueprint for the equitable investment of revenues from the Transportation and Climate Initiative Program, which as many of you know is now largely on ice. Um, so when that announcement came forward back in December, we really had to go back to the drawing board to decide what are we going to do instead to really inform investments going forward and carry this work forward? Um, initially, we thought to do sort of facilitated focus groups across the state with a firm, accompanied by some polling as well, if we could secure the additional funding. And then as we started to get more so into conversations around procedural justice, um, I think that we recognized that we wanted to meet people where they were. And what was, the, what was a very um, simple yet elegant and efficient way to do that, and that really revolved around a community regranting program. So we worked um, with a host of different groups to pull together um, a regrant project, basically where we were able to give grants for folks to host focus groups within their respective service areas all across the state. Um, so I do definitely want to make sure that I um, give another huge shout out to all the folks within that space, Capstone Community Action, CVOEO, Lamoille Community House, Old Spokes Home, CBCOA, Rights and Democracy, the St. Johnsbury Community Hub, and the Vermont Council on Independent Living. Um, all just tremendous groups have done so much community-based work, so it was really such a pleasure. Um, but all of this was in service of the goal of really trying to better hone in on what Vermonters key transportation and public transit challenges were, um, with a particular emphasis on communities that have traditionally either been overburdened by energy burdens or by pollution, and those who are traditionally marginalized and left out of these conversations. Um, so in total, we hosted, I, in total we had well over 78 participants across the state. Um, when you were to look at, um, in terms of demographic breakdown here, about, so we had 78, 78 total, 71% were female, about 28% were male, 72% identified as white, 
28 or 26% identified as BIPOC, 14% spoke um, a language other than English as their primary language, and 47% said that they uh, identified being um, having a disability as well. So that, and that included ambulatory um, and a host of others as well. Um, so got a very large swath of Vermonters from across the state to share some of their key challenges. Um, and what I'll say is this, is that, you know, so the, these were facilitated in very sort of informal focus groups across the state. Each um, facilitator was given a series of questions to ask to the group, which we assembled with feedback from all of the community groups and our advisory committee members. Um, and, you know, so in terms of key challenges identified, I would say that a lot of this was largely confirmational. So when it comes to single occupancy vehicles, I think a recognition that car ownership and maintenance could be incredibly burdensome financially, personally. Access to EVs are far too expensive, not readily available. A lot of concern about range anxiety, infrastructure availability. When it came to public transit especially, that was where we really got the bulk of our feedback. It really related to public transit availability, bus routes reaching out to the last mile, operating within non-traditional hours, so inside and outside of business hours, and it became clear just how pervasive that issue was and how much it was affecting Vermonters' day-to-day -day lives, whether that was accessing healthcare appointments, getting to work on time, getting, getting involved within social groups or community events, it really became clear just how essential a fully functioning transportation system is to Vermonters' way of life, as well as our, their economic longevity. Uh, there were also some creative ideas offered up by these groups as well. Um, and I think that, that and that came up as we discussed sort of what does your ideal transportation system look like. And beyond just readily available public transit systems and electric vehicles, there was also discussion, and I appreciate um, Sue and Amanda's reference to this as well, about rural Uber and on-demand transportation services, um, as well as some non-traditional ones like formalized hitchhiking programs. If many folks have heard of Hitching Post, for example, um, that was identified as just a really positive example of community-driven transportation initiatives. Um, so what we did then was take all of those findings, compile them into a series of policy recommendations, and then in the interest of making sure that we circled back to the community members, we brought them back and asked them, what would be your primary funding priorities? Where do you want to see the bulk of state and federal investment go within our communities? And the answers really were, again, not too surprising based on the feedback, but it was more bus routes, more frequent bus desires, and the more frequent bus service, investing in public transit infrastructure, so thinking about bus shelters, accessibility, trying to create those, commun those uh, community transportation hubs overall. New forms of transit, so again, like I mentioned, rural on-demand ride service, formalized hitchhiking, um, EV infrastructure and incentives comes back. What I would say, a key piece of feedback was incentives need to be on the front end, not on the back end, to be, be able to overcome those affordability barriers. Um, and then also walking and biking infrastructure was nice to hear from folks who are either just outside of town or, or even fairly far outside of town with a ton of interest and enthusiasm for e-bikes, but no means by which to sort of step into that world, whether that's through an e-bike um, rental service or e-bike incentives or other educational services. Um, so overall, we will be pub we're publishing the report now. We intend to share this with key policymakers as well as the Vermont Climate Council as we head into the 2023 session. Um, but once again, it's just been such a joy. We cannot thank our advisory committee members, our facilitators, and EAN as well um, for helping us pull this all together and happy to field questions. Thanks all. And we are also going to do a webinar or two in October with some of those focus group um, to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, Jen wallace Brito, would you like to ask about the future of rural transit? Sure. Oops, I went too far. Hi everyone, Jennifer wells Brito. I'm with VEIC and I have been working with a great group of steering committee members, Peggy O'Neill Vivanco, from Clean Cities, um, and Mariah Kigi from Veep, Jeff Ford, who's a um, very active uh, resident in Richmond, who's bringing a lot of insights to the project. And of course, Kara, who has um, been with this project when she was at Veep and then transitioned when she came to EAN. So we have a really wonderful group of people. And I'd also like to thank VTrans for providing a mobility and transportation innovation grant to support this work, um, which has been really 
critical and having their engagement has been very helpful. So what is the future of rural transit project? Just as a reminder, we've presented this a couple times for those who have not heard about it. Um, it really started with an idea that's been around for a long time. It's like, how can um, we look at school buses and public transit um, and figure out a system that is maybe combined um, that serves both students and the public um, more efficiently? And um, is there a way to, to look at combining this service in some communities um, so that we're not operating two public transit systems, which saves money and energy and greenhouse gases? And if we could get all those people on electric buses, that would be sort of hitting the home run um, from that. So I think many of you um, who particularly live in rural areas might be scratching your head, how come I can't get on that school bus? Um, I need a ride, it goes right past my house. Wouldn't it be great if I could get on that bus? So we started out with that concept and um, we realized that that was very fraught for a number of reasons. Um, maybe one of the biggest ones is that if you have any federal money providing support for a ride, you have to have a certain type of bus that is accessible and fixed routes and there's all sorts of requirements. So we made the decision to really focus on how could we um, look at our public transit system um, and connect it better to the needs of students who are traveling to school, either um, by enhancing um, service where school transportation can't fully meet the needs um, of, of students, particularly for after school activities or to support choice where there's, um, there isn't a local school. Um, and, how, and could that possibly expand service for the general public as well? So um, I'm gonna skip over this because I kind of hit, this is a, more of objectives and I'd like to get some, to some better stuff here. So we've made a lot of progress. Um, we did uh, research on existing combined service models in the state of Vermont and there are some. Um, Burlington is probably the most prominent example um, but we did find that there are rural examples as well. Um, we had uh, heard some great stories from Tri-Valley Transit, which provides um, a route that serves uh, students going to share an academy, um, particularly from communities that don't have a high school in, um, in the white uh, green mountains of Vermont. And um, they can now go to that school because they have transportation provided by their public transit provider. Um, so we've researched models um, in Vermont. Uh, we also thought it would be really helpful to select a couple of school districts that were interested in this concept to go through the process with them, get their, um, figure out who their key stakeholders are, what the opportunity was, um, how people might react to this, and maybe identify some routes in which we could test out our thoughts about whether there are cost savings and energy savings associated with this and what might be some of the barriers. Um, we actually were um, very fortunate to have a very active partner in Tri-Valley Transit. They were able to actually identify a couple of routes that would connect um, Oxbow High School and Blue Mountain High School, or Blue Mountain Union, um, to a, uh, an existing uh, tr transit route by just extending it a little way and providing greater access for students that were maybe trying to get to um, work after school or various other activities. Unfortunately, we're not quite there with getting that um, up and running. Um, we're looking for greater engagement and sort of from the school community, but it was really interesting to, to see that there's, there's with a, just a little bit of extra um, miles put on existing routes, we could serve a whole new population of students um, on public transit. We did a, um, we've been working with the Mount Mansfield Union Unified School District. Um, we did a community and student survey there. Um, we sort of compiled all our findings into a feasibility study that we prepared at the end of last year. Um, and we've had great engagement with the public transit agencies that we're working with, Green Mountain Transit and Tri-Valley Transit. And then one of the great, really um, revealing um, things that we did was that we mapped all of the public transit routes in Vermont and then marked where they're in proximity to existing schools to really show that there's a lot of opportunity to connect schools to public transit systems as a way to um, provide greater service for students. So I really wanted to focus on this next um, slide, which is really the findings that we're, we're getting through this process. Um, so we, we have found that students traveling to school on public transit can work in Vermont, and there are examples of that. I mentioned a couple, but I think there are others. Um, 
We also have found, and this was, I think, one of the biggest takeaways for all of us, is that existing school tra transportation isn't always meeting um, the needs of students and providing them with the type of access to after-school activities or school choice. And if you think about what sets kids up for success in life, it is the ability to participate in sports or other uh, extracurriculars that help them get into schools and and um, pursue the, um, the choices that they want to make after high school. So this is a really significant issue that I don't think we went into this thinking we were going to find, but um, I think it's a really important finding. Um, we also think that public transit could supplement school transportation services to help um, meet that need. Um, so it might be too expensive or challenging for schools to pay for that um, late bus from school, but if public transit is offering a route that students can take advantage of, that could be a great way to meet that need. Um, we also think what we were hoping is that we would be able to identify a way for public transit to actually replace school transportation routes. Um, that would be what I would say would be a long-term vision um, because, again, getting back to the original premise, we're supporting two public transit systems in the state of Vermont. But there's a lot of cultural um, issues, there's a lot of uh, logistical issues um, that are going to that need to come into play for this. So it's not impossible, but it's complicated. And it takes a long-term sort of community building to pursue a strategy like that. And you definitely need local champions that see the vision and can carry that forward. Um, another kind of basic but important finding is that students are an important market segment for public transit ridership. We have great fixed route public transit. I, you know, for a rural state, we have excellent public transit. and. I don't know that those connections are always being made, um, that students could be an important way to sort of bolster that system and provide greater ridership. Um, and then, like anybody, <laughs> getting people on a bus is hard to do. Um, so people like to drive, it's uh, convenient. So if you have that option, um, people tend to prefer to want to drive, um, even if you're a student, much like uh, the general public. Um, so we definitely need to educate our young people who are, in many cases, the people carrying the ball in climate change to connect the dots that driving in your car is not the best thing to do for the climate. That taking the bus to school or walking or biking if you can or even carpooling is going to be much better than driving by yourself. So much like all of us need to be educated about that, I think there's a huge opportunity to educate students about how riding the bus can be a really important climate action on their part. So next steps, um, let me see. Uh, so we're gonna continue to work with Orange East. Mariah from Beep is really um, digging in on that, trying to identify champions within the school district, either students or parents or teachers that really wanna work with the transit agency to make those um, proposed routes work. Um, we're going to work to connect the Mount Mansfield Unified Union School District with planning for a new route, hopefully, in Richmond, um, connect them to that planning effort with Green Mountain Transit. Um, we want to articulate the value proposition to the various audiences that we think are important in this conversation, including developing resources to support that. And then we're going to continue to do outreach to share our findings. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. And then Ryan is going to tell us about clean transportation standard. Great. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Ryan Lamberg, and um, we were honored with uh, um, some opportunity to kind of talk and inform folks about the clean transportation standard. So, much like the clean heat standard, this is a performance based approach that uh, really is to drive down the use of petroleum fuels in our, in our transportation mix, rather than just the heating side. We need both, right? Heating and transportation. What's great about this program is that it's been a proven program on the West Coast uh, for more than 12 years and has driven down millions of carbon um, reduction uh, tons across 
not only California, but in Oregon and Washington State, is now being considered by other states in the Midwest. And our idea, along with, with Peggy um, and, and Alex DePillis, was to kind of bring that idea to Vermont and what that could do. So to do that, um, essentially, uh, what that carbon reduction goal is, is that you, you earn credits by producing and using lower carbon fuels that are not petroleum based, including electrification, including biofuels. Um, and uh, those that have higher carbon intensity uh, generate additional uh, deficits. So what's happened in the last 12 years in, in California, for example, is that we've seen that it went from a largely biofuel way of meeting this policy standard to something that's been dominated and by electrification. Um, so we, we have both biofuels, but it's also really incentivized massive amounts of electrification, uh, both on-road and off-road. Um, so what could that future look like? Well, what is Vermont's future right now? Uh, what, what is the scene today? We have 250 million gallons, approximately, of gasoline use. We've had that for many, many years. We, we're also consuming about 100 million gallons of diesel. So that is the picture. What we need to do is move away from that and diversify. So much like our, our salad bar I was thinking during lunch, we had lots of protein choices, right? It's, it's all of the above. And we really need to embrace uh, different choices for different opportunities. We only have 35 CNG vehicles in the whole state. We could be doing a lot more with RNG from our dairies. We could be doing a lot more with biofuels. We could be doing a lot more with electrification and we need to do that quicker um, with our current and existing infrastructure. So what have we done this year? Well, actually we had a couple webinars, one uh, in 21 and then also one in the spring that's kind of missing here. We spent a lot of time with Jared doing some coordination with the Climate Council, uh, with Joey, with Jane, with others to essentially try to bring those experts from the West Coast and Midwest to bring their voices to the table on, on the low carbon fuel standard how it was implemented, lessons learned, what could be done, um, and to try to infuse that conversation uh, in and throughout as, as one of those great opportunities, especially in light of the fact that the CTI, uh, or TCI, um, went on ice. Um, we've done some coordination with the Great Plains Institute and other advocates and put together a fact sheet. Um, so most importantly, what we want to do moving forward is support the clean heat standard because we know we got so close and the concept is at its core very much the same. So if the clean heat standard can pass this year, we're hoping that the clean transportation standard will be right behind it. Um, the point of it is that it focuses on today's infrastructure and today's vehicles. We can decarbonize quickly by using those not only today, but while we're still building out the electric infrastructure that we've been talking about. Um, so I can't see what I wrote from here, but I will say that it is uh, like the salad bar. It's, it's not either or, it's both and more. So I, I, I really want to emphasize and, and end on that note. So thank you very much. Right, I want to thank these folks. Um, we have kind of run out of time already. Um, there's a key question here um, at the top of the Q&A that I'm just going to go ahead and answer about the climate workforce work, which is about how do we address rising housing and rental costs so trainees and workers can stay and afford to live in Vermont. That group has very specifically decided that there's lots of groups working on childcare, housing, uh, um, transportation, a lot of the, the other ancillary services that these folks need, and we need to focus really closely on the needs of employers and employees um, and, and not those specific needs. So we're not working on, on the housing needs, and uh, we'd love to do that as well, but can't do it all. I will say, clearly we recognize does that work? Clearly yeah. we recognize that's an issue. Uh, one of my district uh, state reps is actually 
uh, very deeply involved in the housing issue. I cited a bunch of millions that we sent to workforce development and training, and it's similar with housing, but housing has been, we, we've been ignoring it for about three or four decades, so um, it's gonna take some time. Thanks. I'm gonna keep all of these questions that you have put in here that we haven't gotten around to answering, and we'll try to get some answers from all of our great presenters and see if we can share those around next week. But for now, I would like to ask you to please take any cups and mugs you have and return them over the next 15 minutes of break because we're actually gonna have a different caterer come in to do our reception and dinner. And you have 15 minutes to stretch and chat a little bit, and then we'll get back together at 2.30. Thank you.